As filmmakers, we're always looking for new ways to enhance our production value so that our work has more impact for our viewers. But we're also always trying to simplify our workflow to make our lives easier, save a bit of time, and usually trying to save as much hard drive space as possible. In the last couple of years, we've seen a brand new camera feature come into the market and it's being included in more and more cameras. What I'm talking about, which you already know because you've seen the title of this video, is H.265 encoding. Through a powerful encoding algorithm, H.265 allows us to record higher quality images with a much lower bitrate, which for us filmmakers is a really good thing because now it means that we have access to higher quality recordings that take up less hard drive space. But there is one problem with H.265 encoding, and that is that it's very taxing on your CPU. And the machines that we have now on the market aren't exactly optimized to play back and edit H.265 files. When new machines come out that are more optimized, this problem's pretty much gonna go away. Um, but for now, like my machine, it's fairly modern. It's a 2016 spec'd up MacBook Pro. Um, it struggles to even play back 4K 24p footage. So in order to take advantage of this new H.265 format, we need to transcode our files to a more edit friendly codec. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Why would you bother recording in H.265 to save the hard drive space, but then end up only transcoding it to a completely different format anyway? So what's the point? Well, it comes down to the fact that in the acquisition process, when we're actually turning that raw data from the camera into an encoded file, H.265 gives us the most bang for buck, the most quality with the lowest file size. And also H.265 is a great format to archive your footage in. So my process is that I'll transcode the files to ProRes and then I'll edit with those files, but keep the original H.265 files but then when I'm finished with the project, it's all delivered, it's all finished, I'll actually delete those ProRes files. But if I ever need to come back at a later date and make changes to that project, which doesn't really happen that often, I can always retranscode those H.265 files back to ProRes. All right, so with that out of the way, now I wanna actually show you guys how I do it. So how I take H.265 footage and encode it into the best possible format for editing. We're gonna be using a software called DaVinci Resolve to do the transcoding. Don't worry, it's free, and I've left a link in the description to that software. So make sure you go ahead and download Resolve before we get started. If you didn't already know, Resolve is a color correction and editing platform that can also perform incredibly fast file exports, and it is my software of choice for this type of work. The other link in the description is the Apple ProRes white paper. So we're also gonna be referring to that to help us figure out the perfect codec to use. Okay, so we're gonna start by opening DaVinci Resolve. And once we get our project screen, we're just gonna to go to new project. Um, I'm just gonna call this transcode um, and then hit okay. So now we've got a new project and you can see our tabs down the bottom here. Um, these are how we basically get around Resolve. Um, for this, we're only gonna be using the edit page and we're gonna come up to our media browser and right click and click import footage. So this is all of our H.265 footage here, except for this last clip. Um, these are all H.265 files you can see because they're black, they have no preview. Um, I'm gonna import those. And now um, we're gonna get this dialog box that says the frame rate doesn't match the current project settings. So by default, it's set to 24p. We wanna change that so our project settings match the frame rate of the clips that we're importing. Just to double check our frame rate here, we can right click on any one of these clips and go to clip attributes and then just check that our frame rate is 59. And then we can also go up to file project settings as well, just to make sure that our timeline is the same frame rate as our footage. And while we're here, we're also going to change our timeline resolution to the resolution of the clips, which is 4K or 3840 by 2160. So once we're happy with that, we can click save and now we're ready to go. So now we're gonna highlight all our clips by clicking on the first one, holding shift, clicking on the last one, and we're gonna drag those down onto the timeline. So now once they're all there, we can check that all our clips are in the timeline. So the next step, we're actually gonna skip over these next two tabs, um, the color and the sound tab. We're gonna go right to the end to the export or deliver tab. 
and now we get a completely different screen um, and we get all these different options for how we want to export our video. So on the left hand side we have all our options for our encoding. Down the bottom we of course have our timeline and then on the right hand side we have our queue. So all of the clips that will be exported will show up in our queue. First of all we're just going to change our file name to something relevant. The next step is we're going to choose where we want to save these files. So I've got a folder set up here. This next step is really important. So we have an option here either to save a single clip or individual clips. For this project, because we want all of these clips to be um, individual files themselves so we can edit them, we want to of course select individual clips. Now we just want to make sure that we've got our export video option ticked. And then this is where it gets interesting. So this is our codec. So we're going to choose QuickTime and then the actual codec itself. So you can see here we've got a bunch of different options and we just want to choose the one that's right for our footage. So how we actually find that out is we have to take into consideration the bitrate at which our footage was shot and then find a suitable codec that matches that bitrate as close as we can. So for that we're going to use the Apple ProRes white paper and I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom where we have this table that shows us all of the different bitrate targets for each different codec under the ProRes encoding format. So you can see here we've got all our different resolutions, then all our different flavors of codec and we're going to find our resolution which is 3840 by 2160. Then we're going to find our frame rate which is 60 frames per second and we're looking at a bit rate here of 363 megabits per second. Um, as we go up we also have some higher bit rates here. Because our files from the Fuji were recorded at 200 megabits per second, we're going to choose the lowest format which is ProRes Proxy because its bitrate is as close to 200 as possible. That way we know because the bitrate of Proxy is 363 megabits per second, we're not actually going to lose any quality if we transcode to this format. So hopefully this makes sense. We just want to choose a codec that's going to fit all the information from our original file into this new transcoded file. The next thing is to make sure that our resolution of our timeline is the same as the source clips. So here we've got 3840 by 2160. So opening up the panel further, there's not much else here in this window to check. Coming over to the file tab, we're going to leave all of these at default, except we're just going to come down and make sure our render speed is set to maximum. One last thing you want to check before you add this to the render queue is just to make sure that you've got the entire timeline selected so that we're going to export all the clips in our timeline. So now that we're happy that we've got all our settings correct, we've selected the entire timeline, we can add this to our render queue. And we simply just press render and then we wait. Okay, so I'm going to fast forward through this process because obviously it can take a little bit of time. I usually let my transcoding happen overnight so that it doesn't interrupt my normal workflow. I would recommend that if you have time to do the same thing. And you've probably already guessed that H.265 isn't the right acquisition codec for quick turnarounds. For that, I'd probably stick to regular H.264. So now that our transcoding has completed, we can go into the finder window where we saved our files and just check that everything's there and that there's no encoding errors. As you can see as well, the files are playing back beautifully now, no drop frames, everything is pretty much perfect. So I just wanted to demonstrate now how well these clips are gonna play back. So I'm opening up a new Premiere project and I'm gonna import all of my footage. So as you can see here, our clips load straight away and they're scrubbing through with the thumbnail view. And then if we open a clip, we can play it back in full resolution. We can scrub through the clip, no drop frames. Everything is pretty much perfect from here. So now we're going to select all of our clips, um, right click and modify, and then we're going to interpret the footage so that we turn our 60 frames per second into slow motion by selecting 24 frames per second. So now all of our footage is in slow motion. If we play some back, we can see um, that worked really well. So now all of our clips are in slow motion and they're still playing back really well within Premiere. So I thought I'd do a little test here and pull some footage down onto the timeline, add some effects, do some color grading, just to show you how easy it is to play back these files now. 
If you guys want to see my exact color grading process as well, I've also got a video um, of that on my channel. I'll leave the link in the description below. So make sure you go and watch that video if you're interested in knowing how I color grade this kind of footage. So we've added multiple LUTs to this clip. We've also adjusted some color wheels. And what I'm going to do next is add some crop bars as well to this. And we're going to add some sharpening as well. So the sharpening effect will add some more load to the CPU, but you can see that even after we've added the sharpening, there's no problems in playing back and scrubbing through this footage at full resolution. That's all there is to it guys. If this helped you out, I want you guys to leave a turtle emoji comment in the comment section below. Um, but if you have any questions as well, please let me know, leave them in the comments. I try to help out as many people as possible. So as always, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll catch you in the next one.